morning, especially on such a beautiful Lord's Day. The last time I spoke to you, we were studying the first days of creation. I would like to continue that this morning. Starting off with a brief review of the things we talked about. If you would call to mind, day one, we talked about God creating space, time, and matter, and ultimately light. We talked about what those things meant, how they affect us, and we looked at a couple other details. <clears throat> then we looked at day two, and how that dealt with God creating Earth's atmosphere, the protective layers that make it up, as well as the waters that were created and were divided. We discussed day three of creation. We looked at the formation of the seas as well as the dry land and noted the creation of vegetative life. And then we got to day four and we noted the creation of the, our sun, our moon, the stars and all the other planets, not just in our solar system, but even those be excuse me, beyond. Now this morning, I would like for us to consider beginning with day five, moving forward with the first days of our existence, the first creation week. So in Genesis chapter one, verses 20 through 23, I normally use the King James Bible, but for reading these four verses, I would prefer to read them from the American Standard Version because I think it does a much more or a slightly better description as to what was going on. In verse 20 it says, And God said, Let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great monsters and every living creature that moveth, wherewith the waters swarmed, after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was, the, there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. Now it's very similar to the King James translation and rendering of it. But especially in verse 20 where it says swarming with swarms of living creatures. And you consider even a droplet of water that we pull from our oceans and how much life is in that droplet of water. I think it's a very pretty picture of the words used there painting what is actually in physical existence. So we note verse 20 that uh, the waters of earth are swarming with creatures. They're being filled with life. Indeed, they are living. We see the Hebrew word nephesh here used rather than in regards to plant veg or vegetative life. It's not, it, it's not conscience life. It's not breathing life, though it is biological life. So these water creatures are living and breathing creatures. We note in verse 21 the use of sea monsters. The King James Version uses great whales. The Hebrew term there is tanim. That's a singular use. In, in the plural, it'd be tanim with an M on the end. And that means a marine or land monster that is a sea serpent or jackal, dragon, sea monster, serpent, or whale. Now there's quite a bit of debate over exactly what this term means in this verse. But basically, it's a hideous monster. Um, especially regarding animals. You know, we, we joke about that all the time, but regarding sea life. So no doubt, this would refer to those marine dinosaurs, sharks that we're often afraid of, and all manner of ocean life that we could think of and see in museums. And certainly it would include those animals that are less offensive to us, like red snapper and the like. 
It was, it was asked not too long ago, well, did dinosaurs exist? Well, they certainly did. We have evidence of them in our fossil record. So at some point of the creation week, they had to have come into existence. I believe at this point, some of them are. We would note in Job chapter 41, the mention of Leviathan. That chapter has always fascinated me because I have always liked dragons. And you look at every civilization that's been in existence, by and large, they're going to have some type of story of dragons. And they all look very similar. It's almost as if these types of creatures existed and they were all here to record them. No doubt that is a dinosaur. After all, that term means terrible lizard. So now our waters, the waters of earth, are swarming with life. Various kinds of life. Now on to day six. Genesis chapter 1 verses 24 through 31. We have recorded it saying, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So we see these are the creation of the land animals. There's three terms here that are, we kind of read over them, but they're quite interesting. The term cattle, behemoth, which is dealing mainly with your beasts of burden, your larger quadrupeds, like elephants and what we would consider cattle today, boss indigus and the like. Then you have creeping thing, which is ramus, referring to those things that are rapidly moving. I think it was posted yesterday, there was a copperhead found. That would be a creeping thing. Anything that would slither on the ground that would rapidly move, like snakes, reptiles, insects, because this also deals with those things that would swarm. And would also be considered the worms, earthworms that you would use for fish bait, and th those things like them. And then we have the third word, or third word here, being beast, which is the Hebrew word kahi. This refers to wild animals with appetite. These would be carnivorous creatures. Though I think we should keep in mind that there is no death at this point in, in creation. So no flesh was killed at this point. In fact, death would not come into the world until later where mankind would sin and bring death into the world. So at this time, and we'll read in the verses following, all these animals ate plants. I think movies like Jurassic Park have really ruined that image in our minds. How Jurassic Park is over here, you got your T-Rex and he's being fed a goat. No. T-Rex would have eaten maybe a pineapple. Um, it would not have been flesh at this time. Now certainly later, if any of them survived the flood, which I don't believe they did, they would have eaten meat. But at this time of creation, they ate only plants. Everything in creation was a vegan. I'm glad we've learned better. Thankfully, God allowed us and even animals to eat meat after the flood because they are quite tasty. Now, the creation of land animals, this would also include the, the creation of land dinosaurs. I would point your attention to Job chapter 40, verses 15 through 24, where there it mentions behemoth. There's been several folks that claim that's a hippo, but I don't know of a hippo that can drink an entire stream in one gulp or have bones as strong as brass and be described as in the context sounds more like a brontosaurus. Certainly that's not the only behemoth in existence. We have evidence in our fossil record otherwise. Then in verses 26 and 27 we have the creation of man. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So we see that, that man is made after God's image. In a Bible class a few years ago, uh, there was a lady that asked that, what does that mean? Because if we're all made in God's image, God must be ugly. Well, in her ignorance, she made that statement. That's not what it's dealing with. God formed our spirits. We know this from Zechariah <clears throat> chapter 12, verse 1, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. Because of this, because of being created by God with this spirit, we are a moral being. We can choose and we can know right from wrong. Joshua chapter 4, 24, verse 15. If you look throughout our history as, as a human race, you'll find the evidence that mankind has always wanted to worship something. It might be a corrupted God. It might be a plurality of gods. You can look throughout our history and consider the ancient Babylonians. Even the Hindu, they have millions of gods. That's considered to be the oldest religion in, in history. Although that's false, it is quite an interesting study. If you read Romans chapter 1, you'll be seeing that that is indeed the case. We inherently want to worship something. And you think about modern times, the atheist, the agnostic, the evolutionist, they worship man. Oftentimes they worship themselves. They might not admit to it, but that's exactly what they're doing. We also point that man has a sense of ought. He has a conscience. When someone mentions the Holocaust and the 11 million people that were slain because of what they were, setting aside the fact that they were humans, do you have a cold shiver run up your spine? You think about all the babies today that have already been murdered, it's only 10 o'clock, through abortion. Does that bother you? It should. In the debate of Dr. Um, Dr. Flew and Brother Thomas B. Warren, Brother Warren pointed out the law of the excluded middle. And he mentioned either a thing is human or it is non-human. Well, Dr. Flew's rebuttal of that was, well, I've actually seen something non-human, but not quite human. Kind of an in-between state. And he pointed out that people with dementia cease to be human, but they're not quite non-human. That's a disgusting mentality. But nonetheless, anyone that holds to atheistic evolution must think that way. You cease to be human when you have some type of deformity. And we'll get to a little bit of the implications of that later. And third, we point out from this passage that God gave the pattern of the home. We see one man and one female, one woman. How many genders do you read about in these two verses? Well, it says male and female created he them. I don't know what number we're up to. I think it was 167 different genders at some point. Well, that sounds more like 167 different disorders that we're having to deal with nowadays because people can't come to grips with their own reality. God made two genders two sexes, male and female. And he prescribed them being married and being the first home. Because of this, homosexuality would also be outlawed, outruled. Because again, male and female, this is the pattern. If I want to build a slab for a house, I'm going to have to build a form for that concrete when it's a liquid to flow into and make that little rectangular prism that I want to hold up a house. But it's a form, it's a pattern. If I'm going to build a 69 Corvette, I'm going to follow the instructions to get my desired model car. 
In fact, I did, and it looks pretty nice. If I didn't, you think I would have got the desired result? Absolutely not. The desired result for God is one man, one woman, for life. My, have we wandered so far from that pattern today. We see Jesus referencing this pattern in Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. Next, we note the responsibilities that God gave mankind. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 through 31, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all, that, or all, of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we see that man was tasked with replenishing or filling the earth. He was also tasked with subduing the earth, which is kalbash in Hebrew. It mainly deals with conquering. We want to overcome the earth. It's not in the sense of destroying it, but calling it under your authority. Then we see that God was tasking man to have dominion, a raw doll, over all of creation, all of the animals. This deals primarily with rain or rule. We, know we, we use reins on horses to tell them where we want to go. Nowadays, we just use a steering wheel, depending on how many horses you've got. Now, we've heard before that with great power comes great responsibility, and certainly this is the case in this event. Though we are supposed to subdue and have dominion over all of creation, we must handle it responsibly. We are to care for and use this creation. If we use it all up, there's not going to be any creation left for our children. So we need to be mindful of passing this, this creation onward to future generations. Now that's not a hippie coming out in me. That's the fact that if you spend all your money you're not going to have any money left at the end of the day. What do you want to do? You'd rather put it in a savings account and use smaller amounts. That way tomorrow is taken care of. We must not abuse this creation. There's different ways we can do that. There is a proper balance to things. You look today and how these animal rights activists push that name any animal, they basically have more rights than humans do. That is not the case. However, we should be taking care of our animals, our pets, everything that's in existence. We see that God called this the sixth day. We also see that he called creation at this time very good. It has been said before that mankind was the crowning jewel of creation. Because if you will remember, after every day he said it's good. After the sixth day he said it's very good. Now in chapter 2 of Genesis, we consider day 7 of creation. First three verses read as follows. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in, that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. So creation has been completed, verse 1. Now I think it, it wise for us to keep in mind that it's not necessarily referring to everything that we see now. Not only have we had a catastrophic flood that wiped the earth of all sin and most of creation, but we're mainly seeing the, the descendants of this creation week. There existed and had to have existed in each of these animals, the purest of bloodlines. 
you might say, the original version. We're mainly dealing with the carbon copies. Now God mentions these different kinds. That's not in reference to a species. We have quite a few species today. You might call to mind the dogs. All these different breeds of dogs that we have, we have bred them to, be, to meet certain requirements that we as their owners needed at that time. Do you think God made corgis on this first week? Or dachshunds? Or huskies? My personal favorite. He didn't have to. He made all the building blocks during this week. And through process of time, these new species, all the same kind, these different species came into being. We see that God rested. It's not mean he got tired and he decided to stop. No, he ceased his work. He simply ceased, at least his work. <clears throat> we see in verse 3 that God blessed and sanctified this day. That's not to say that this was the first Sabbath day. You see, we must note that Moses is the human hand recording all this for us, and he has had the perspective of an added 2,500 years in writing this, thereabout. And we see that the term Sabbath is used for the first time in Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. And it's in regards to the Israelites. And this term would only be used regarding them. We see Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 2 through 3, as well as verse 15. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 13 through 14, as well as Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 10 through 13. That's the creative week. All things are in existence. Now I would like for us to consider a few things. Namely, the cause of life. In our study of day one, we noted the following causes and effects. There is limitless space. Therefore, the cause must be infinite. There is endless time. Therefore, the cause must be eternal. There is boundless energy. Therefore, the cause must be omnipotent. There are universal interrelationships. Therefore, its cause must be omnipresent. There is seemingly infinite complexity. Therefore, its cause must be omniscient. And finally, there is life. Therefore, the cause must be living. There must be an uncaused first cause that possesses not one, not two, but all of these traits and so many more. We know that being is Jehovah God. For indeed, He does possess all of these traits. You go outside and go pick up a rock. It can be a very big rock or it can be a little rock. Try to have a conversation with that rock. Try to do it in private, because other people, otherwise folks might think you're crazy. Do you think that rock is going to act for its own being and create things? Certainly not. Matter alone cannot account for all that is in existence. Well, now we have the theory of evolution, theory in quotes, because it's not really a theory. It's just a failed explanation of what godless people try to explain things with. The simplest definition of evolution is this. The change over time of the genetic composition of a given population. Now they would say that given enough time, say 3.8 billion years, different changes in the genes of a given population, maybe this population moves places so it changes then too, and then they develop useful, useful traits and then natural selection comes along and basically that's removing all the warning labels and letting things take care of themselves. And eventually, through long enough time, you'll get a different kind. Now I have, I was able to find <clears throat> an article by Brother Warren and he posed the question 
says a simple question which evolutionists cannot answer. Which was first on earth? A woman or a human baby? Basically, the chicken or the egg question. Now, I'm not going to read that article, but I would certainly encourage you to attempt to find it and read it for yourselves, but it's quite interesting read. And it's certainly applicable today. We also note the law of biogenesis. Now, we're not going to have enough time to go into all of it, but this has been a law because it's been proven. Life only comes from pre-existing life. And it will only produce those things that are its kind. And we've already stated that the cause of all life must itself be living. Therefore, Jehovah God is the only one qualified to create. For He is alive. We even sing the song, Our God, He is Alive. And what a marvelous song that is. Now I would like to read the few moments we have left from a book I was able to find. It's called Icons of Evolution, Science or Myth, Why Much of What We Teach About Evolution is Wrong. And it's by Jonathan Wells. Well, on page 178, it mentions a, a little bug that I've actually grown quite fond of and studying for all these things. It's a fruit fly. It says, One organism page 178, in which morphological mutations have been extensively studied is the fruit fly. And they give it scientific name, Drosophila. Among the many mutations that are now known in this fly, some cause the normally two-winged fruit fly to develop a second pair of wings. Now that's marvelous. Since 1978, the four-winged fruit fly has become increasingly popular in textbooks and public presentations as an icon of evolution. But four-winged fruit flies do not occur spontaneously. They must be carefully bred in the laboratory from three artificially maintained mutant strains. Furthermore, the extra wings lack flight muscles, so the mutant fly is seriously handicapped. Four-winged fruit, fruit flies testify to the skill of geneticists, and they help us to understand the role of genes in development, but they provide no evidence that DNA mutations supply the raw materials for morphological evolution. That morphological evolution is what we would normally call macroevolution, one kind into another. We see change within a species, but as it said, we see the, the skill of our geneticists. Not to belittle the great things scientists have done over the years, but when it comes to origins and it comes to trying to disprove God, these scientists are merely children playing with Legos. They're using the building blocks they already have at their disposal to attempt to disprove God by saying, we're going to design something to say that there is no design in nature. Therefore, no designer. This reminds me of something my grandfather told me. It's in kind of a funny scenario. That at one time, a group of scientists decided, you know, we're going to get together and we're going to create life from matter. He said, you know, they did all their studies. They got their PhDs. They got all the funding they needed to start creating life. And they started conducting their experiments. And eventually they got down to their, their main experiment. Okay, the plan is we're going to start creating. And lo and behold, they made something living. They created life. And they said, well, P, look at us. We've just made life. And then right after that, God says, get your own dirt. It's easy for us to reassemble things. But we cannot create from nothing ex nihilo, such as God the Father has done. That is an impossibility for us as the creatures. But nothing is impossible with God. Now this all-powerful being must exist, whether it's matter or it is God. I hope that these studies have 
solidified in your mind and served as a good foundation to prove that there is a God and that He is our Creator and Sustainer. And if it is the case that He is in existence, and He is, we are under His rule, we are under His authority. We must obey Him. To not would be to sin. In every case, sin deserves death. Adam and Eve were punished for their sin. They were removed from the garden. And later, God destroyed the world with water because of sin. We know that He gave a visual promise to Noah and his family, as well as his descendants, that He would never destroy the world with water again. We know that as the rainbow. Genesis chapter 9, verse 13 and 17, verses 13 through 17. Now you look at that rainbow. We normally refer to it as Roy G. Biv, to name all the different colors. The rainbow has several different colors in it, but it's one rainbow. And I think particularly useful in today's current events, us as humans come in a variety of colors. You've got black, you've got white, you've got red, you've got yellow, and just about anything in between. How many races are there? There is but one, and that is the human race. God sent His Son to die for that race. And just as the individual obeys the gospel that God has given us, they do not become a white Christian, they do not become a black Christian, they do not become a red Christian or any other shade, hue, or shade, a tint. Get my colors right sooner or later. They simply become a Christian. And I think we would do well to remember that. Noah's flood also supplied a type for baptism. It is that baptism, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 through 21, that removes our sins. It's by which it's the medium that we contact the blood of our Savior. At that point, we become that Christian. Well, we must indeed hear God's word first. We must believe it. We must grow our faith in it. That it would cause us to repent of our past sins. Then we must confess Christ before others. At that point, we are a candidate for that baptism. <clears throat> Now, if those things apply to you, if you need to study more, if you need to become a Christian this morning, please take this time to do so. Or if you are a Christian or a child of God and you've allowed sin back into your life, take this time to have that removed. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Whatever the need may be, come together as we stand and sing.